Okay, so let's get started. Uh, so hi everybody. Thanks very much for, for coming uh, at Docker for the Container D Summit. Uh, so we'll get started now. Uh, so first a little bit about the agenda. Uh, so we'll, we'll start with a, a, a deep dive uh, on Container D uh, with some of the uh, Container D team. Uh, so uh, we'll talk about the container execution and supervision, uh, image distribution and local storage, network interface management and uh, how to integrate Container D in other systems with the native plumbing API. Uh, then we'll have a talk uh, by Phil from IBM about uh, how to use a gRPC API to drive containers in Containerd. Uh, and then we'll have uh, Tim uh, uh, Hawkins from, uh, from Google, who's going to talk about uh, Containerd and the Kubernetes CRI. So one of the goals of Containerd is to be embedded into other systems, so Kubernetes is a very good target for that. Uh, at 12.30, we'll have lunch for an hour, and then in the afternoon, we'll have uh, uh, hack sessions. Uh, so one will be so there will be two of them uh, first uh, from uh, 12, uh, 1.30 to uh, 3.30. On, uh, one on uh, execution and supervision. Uh, so Michael will lead that, and then one on image distribution and local storage uh, with Stephen and Derek. Uh, so that will be in some of the rooms around here. Uh, so we have the whole floor for the day. Uh, then at four, we'll have another hack session on uh, how to integrate Containerd with other systems. Um, so, so talking about the native plumbing level API, the CRI and networking. Um, so Phil, Tim and Michael will lead that. Uh, we'll do a little, uh, dur during the hack sessions, I'll ask uh, for at, there to be at least one note taker. Uh, so that we can have notes of uh, what the hack session produced in terms of decisions of where we should be going. Uh, and then uh, we'll do a recap of all these sessions uh, at five and then a happy hour at six. So we'll have some drinks uh, coming here. Uh, when, uh, when you registered for this event, uh, there was a, a donation of money uh, that, that was a, uh, and uh, we, we didn't tell you where this would go, so that would that will go to uh, Girls Develop It. Uh, it's um, it's an, um, a nonprofit uh, that helps uh, bring women uh, into uh, technology. Uh, we're having the summit today, and the goal is to help uh, drive the roadmap for Container D and get it embedded into other systems. At DockerCon, uh, for, so who here is coming to DockerCon? Okay, can you raise your hands? Okay, so if you're coming, uh, please plan to, uh, I, I don't think we have announced this yet, but the, the third day of DockerCon, I think it's the first day, uh, we're going to have um, a Docker internal summit and there will be a section for Containerd, so please come to that. Uh, that will be kind of the next step and the next time that we gather all the community around Containerd. Uh, there will be other uh, topics uh, of Docker internals, all the plumbing that are part of Docker, like LibNetwork, Notary, SwarmKit, InfraKit, and all the kits. Uh, so, so it's on 420. So Containerd, what is the core container runtime? As we announced, uh, the goal is to extend Containerd uh, to do container execution and supervision like it's doing today, but also do image distribution, network interface management, local storage, and uh, provide a native plumbing API uh, for it to be embedded in other systems. Uh, the goal is that uh, Containerd can be the core container runtime sitting on top of uh, a layer of standards that are provided by OCI, the Open Container Initiatives for uh, runtime and image management. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, everybody is free to implement their own uh, uh, full-blown system. So at Docker, we're doing that with SwarmKit and a bunch of other components. Uh, but you see all the other systems that people are implementing. We hope that all of these systems end up adopting uh, Containerd. And so the, the target for Containerd is uh, to ship uh, in Q2 2017. Uh, so I guess that means uh, 31st of December 2017 uh, to ship a one <laughs> target uh, 
uh, with a target architecture uh, all implemented, and it will have different subsystems for distribution, bu managing bundles and the runtime, uh, built on top of a series of components for managing content, metadata, snapshots, uh, the executor and the supervisor, and it will expose a higher level gRPC API for embedding, and as well as metrics for, for uh, Prometheus integration. Uh, container D is going to be donated to a foundation. I don't have any news on that. Uh, I know there's been lots of discussions uh, with uh, different, uh, different entities about where it will land, uh, but one thing we committed to is that we'll make an announcement by the end of Q1 for where the code base lands. Uh, one last thing, if you want, between these meetings when we get together, if you want to learn about uh, the status of container D and how it's going on, uh, uh, Stephen and Michael and some of the other maintainers, they're, um, they're producing these development reports. The last one is from uh, uh, last week, uh, and they're very in-depth explaining the progress and, uh, and how the project is evolving. So without further ado, I let, I let uh, um, uh, Stephen uh, talk about the internals of Container D. Hey, how are you, how you doing? Uh, thanks for coming today. Um, so the, so the first thing I want to uh, talk about is that uh, there's a lot of new stuff in Container D, but uh, what we want to focus on is that Container D is actually, it's an evolution, it is, it's not a rewrite. It's, it's, the, it's kind of the next step in Docker. We've taken um, Docker to, uh, it's, 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 it's at a point where we need to take the things that we've been working with for several years and uh, reconsolidate them into a single project and a single runtime. And it, it's, that's a clear message we've gotten from the community um, and it's a it's it's a, a, a conclusion that we've arrived at internally. So um, this is it, the 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 goal of this project is not to build new things, but to take the concepts that we've been leveraging over the past three years and then and consolidate them into a single uh, community uh, driven project. So as far as this uh, talk goes, um, we're going uh, we're going to cover um, a lot about architecture and a lot about the flow that goes into. Uh, the container D approach to uh, image distribution and containers and um, execution. And so I, I'm going to start out and talk uh, about the uh, about distribution and the content store. And then uh, Derek McGowan will be uh, discussing uh, the details of the snapshot drivers, which are the equivalent to graph drivers in, in the Docker engine. Um, and then uh, I think uh, Mikhail uh, will take over for bundle creation. Uh, Mikhail Laventer, and then uh, Michael Crosby will be uh, speaking about execution at the end. So uh, we're going to jump right into it. Um, so what, um, oh, and also I want to mention that like if, if there's any questions or anything that's uh, clear, like feel free to stop, uh, like stop me and, and ask, like um, it should be a kind of informal summit feel for this talk. So um, if there's anything that's unclear, you know, just, you know, pipe up and we can, uh, we can take questions in line. So, um, so again, diving right in, um, what do runtimes need? What does a container runtime need? Um, so if we look at like, like run C, uh, when, you, when you start up run C, it expects a few things to already exist. And, um, and there's two aspects to that. There's the uh, root file system, which is, uh, a, you know, bin, user, uh, lib, et cetera, uh, and uh, a config. And, but the challenge to that is getting those things. And um, the, the thing that kind of, uh, that you see in, in actual production systems is the ability to move, is, is move those things around. And, and we do this with, with something called images. And this is uh, what the uh, container community has kind of arrived at. Um, so, so we can kind of break this down, we can, we can look at it. And, and so this is, this is a, a slide that shows the, the concept of going from the structure of Docker and OCI images uh, into like an OCI spec and a root file system. And there's a, a couple of key points about this uh, diagram. We have um, an index or a manifest list, um, as it's called in the Docker format, um, and then a manifest. And so inside of a manifest, um, we, uh, we have various different kinds of architectures of images that we can point at. And each one of those can actually point at its own manifest and, and own, uh, uh, with a, each with its own config and own set of layers which can all be converted to a root file system uh, and an OCI spec. Now, the, so, so if we look at this, we can, we can actually 
um, you know, th this is kind of an abstract diagram, but all, all of these, like each one of these boxes is represented by uh, like a, a, a JSON blob, and I, I, I kind of have a, uh, it in the background here. Um, but we can, um, but the question is, how do we identify that, that JSON blob? So in, um, in, in the OCI format and the Docker format, um, we identify everything by a digest, and we use, and we use something called content addressability to, uh, to identify everything. So, um, it, so I have a couple of examples here, um, and this is using um, the, the Go digest package from Open Containers, and you can see we have the digest of foo, uh, and then we have an example of a digest of foo that's been tampered with, and we can see that they're different. So we, we can tell the difference in the content because the digests are different, or the hash is different. Um, and then um, what, we're, what we've done here in this third line is we've taken the, uh, the digest of just the string foo and we've put it in with another string bar. And so we kind of, we end up with this structure where you say, I have bar here and, uh, and a hash, and this hash is actually referencing foo, such that if I try to put foo tampered under it, I can, I can take this hash and I can compare it with the hash inside of this thing such that it's pointing at it. So if this is tampered with, this hash uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll be able to detect that tampering. So we take this concept and we apply it to the image formats and we can actually digest each of these components so that uh, this, if, if any bit that's referenced in any of these trees is changed, like if I tamper with like, a, like a, um, an attribute here, it'll change the digest at the top. And so this, this makes a very tamper resistant system uh, for uh, uh, distributing and storing and, and, and caching and, and using images. And this concept is, is very, very important to uh, a secure image di distribution system. So a little bit, um, so I'm going to show this diagram a few times because it's, it's very interesting. Um, and it, it, it's the, the data flow diagram uh, of how you actually pull an image in, inside of Containerd. Um, as, well, as well as somewhat in Docker and somewhat in Rocket, um, uh, you'll find uh, kind of all of these, these component themes, but this is going to be the actual architecture of Conta Containerd internally. Um, and we just want to review it before getting into the um, uh, detailed aspects of the content store. So I've actually uh, colored each, um, each process uh, with the arrows. So, so each one of these is, is, is a, like a storage system that you can interact with in Containerd. We have, uh, we've implemented the content store and we have a snapshot driver that you can work with, and then the uh, metadata store is currently uh, in work. But you can see here we have like a pull process that actually controls a fetch and unpack process, and you can see um, the, the various pieces that, uh, so uh, pull is, is represented by purple, right? So pull will instruct the fetch to start, and the fetch will consume uh, data from a remote and then put it into the content store, and then it will register that content with the metadata store, pull, will uh, you know, store the status of the fetch in the metadata store, correlating all the metadata. Um, and then we can, then, then once that, the pull, the pull of the content from the remote is all ready, um, we, we start our unpack process. And we can see that we pull, con we pull from the content store, we pull from the metadata store, and our goal with the unpack process is to actually create um, snapshots. And we'll get into exactly what snapshots are and how they work here in a second. Now, the, so the, so the um, so hopefully that provides uh, a little bit of context for the content service. So the content service is basically a, a verified, uh, it's a verified content addressable storage. And what this means is that I pop content into the top with a write. It's a transactional write, meaning that like you write a complete set of content or not, and what you get out is a hash that identifies that content uniquely. Um, and th this is SHA-256. I don't know if anybody saw this morning, there was a a fancy shattered thing that SHA-1 was dead, and I was like, whew. <laughs> you know, um, and anyways, we're using SHA-256, but, um, but this is the same concept here, is that we're using a, uh, a cryptographic hash to identify all of the content. Um, and, uh, and like I had back on the slide where it was showing the digest all over the place, that, was, um, that just allows us to uh, use Merkle trees to identify problems with the content. Anyways, um, so, so we define this content service, and um, what, this, what this does is it kind of defers trust to this one aspect of the system. And not necessarily trust from a, from a naming perspective or, or a namespace perspective, but trust from a content perspective. So that I can say, so the in, 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 in the code that interacts with Containerd, you don't need to worry about like, oh, did I hash it right? 
No, as long as you run it through the content service and then retrieve it through the content service, and as long as that content service is, is part of your, like, your, your trusted domain, uh, you should be fairly safe. And it simplifies a lot of code um, that, that has become very complex in Docker today. Um, so we have, there's, right now there's four, uh, there's four, so this is a gRPC uh, definition, and there's four uh, methods right now. There's gonna be a few more related to uh, deletion, um, which we haven't quite worked out yet. Um, but there's like an info, uh, this will tell you things, statuses, or, or not statuses, but uh, disposition about your content. So like, you, like your size, um, uh, mostly just size, but <laughs> I, I think there's a few other things in there. Um, and then we, you can read content, you can read content at any offset, um, and it'll actually do chunking and streaming back for you um, in gRPC. And then um, we have the write side, um, which uh, this, this write request, which I don't have a slide for, um, actually will do a completely transactional write that's re -entrant. So like if uh, two people are trying to write to the same thing, they can choose keys such that um, they'll collide. So, so what can actually happen is you can have a parallel writer saying, hey, I'm gonna write to this key, and another person can generate that same key and then go, oh wait, there's already a write of this particular content uh, occurring right now, and it can back off and then wait for the other person to write that content. And this, this greatly simplifies the uh, parallelism story for actually writing content in uh, four containers. Um, and the other one we have is a, is a status request. Um, and this will, this will, this is kind of, um, so where info is about like immutable blobs, status is about ongoing writes. And um, basically, so status is here, you know the, the, the progress of bars inside of, uh, inside of Docker? Uh, status is, is the um, thing that you use to implement that effectively. And, and um, uh, in, inside of Containerd, you can actually query all of the active writes going in on the content store. And so we use this, this content store as kind of a, a centralized location to coordinate the, the writes that are going on at any time. So um, kind of stepping back here, are there any questions? Is this, is this everybody getting this? Oh, okay, good. All right, so um, so so the manifest. Going back, let, let's actually uh, take a quick peek at, at what's in a manifest. So manifest um, is this part, um, and so most images today uh, don't actually contain an index or manifest list. This is kind of a, a forward-thinking thing, and, and um, there's a few out there. Uh, like Phil Estes has um, like a busy box image that, that definitely has a manifest list and that, that dispatches. But for the most part, the manifest and the config are the most important parts of images today. Um, and if I have a manifest, like, like I, I don't need a name, I can just run that manifest as an image. That, that, that's a complete image as it is. And I can identify it by hash. But um, these hashes are really hard to memorize. So, um, so the, the, the basic problem that we see in um, image distribution is I have a name, say Ubuntu, and I need to get a hash for the uh, for the digest. And this is this is actually the hash as of last night. So hopefully that so you could you could actually um, do if you're if you have Docker you could do like Docker run Ubuntu at this hash, and that that should actually select the same manifest that I saw last night. And I and I didn't get this through Docker. I actually got it through a tool that I'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, so, like, uh, so, so this is the basic problem. Um, there, there's, there's other parts to this. So, like, um, you can do all sorts of things uh, with, with naming. So, like, for example, there's a project called Notary where um, its entire purpose is to securely map names into hashes, and, and that's, um, and, and, and it, that, that relies on a technology called Tuff, which you can apply to other, uh, other uh, uh, naming distribution formats, like. Um, like I, I know they have it for like uh, PyPy, which is the Python packaging system. Um, and it's, but it's the same problem. I have a name and I want to get a hash and I need to trust if that name and hash match up because the hash is very strong, but the name uh, can be very weak and it's very, uh, there's a lot of places to tamper with it. So a little bit more about naming in Docker. So um, this is, uh, so, so this slide is showing all the different kind of naming formats in Docker. Right? And um, there's a grammar if you want it come talk to me later, uh, it's crazy. Uh, we tried to, like, we've tried to get it right um, in the past, um, na name, naming isn't crazy, the grammar is, the, gra the grammar is what's crazy. Um, 
but we finally unified this into a single package just in the last few months, and this is the distribution reference package. And this is this is this is this doesn't apply to Container D. We're not going to import all of that, but I just wanted to highlight the complexity of naming in Docker. We have the, all this, the different kinds of, of naming um, approaches here. We have uh, just a single, um, you know, Ubuntu. We have an Ubuntu uh, that's untagged, which will default to latest. We have a a, a tagged reference. Um, we have uh, like a, um, uh, a a reference that's tagged with latest, like, and you can see here. And so, what we can do is, is each one of these, right? We can take this and we can actually expand it to a full canonical reference. And you can see here, like, this is a reference with a hash, and this is a. Um, you can see we've taken latest and we've resolved it to a hash here. We've taken the hash here and just copied it over. But you can see you can represent um, all of these uh, different kinds of uh, content sources as a full canonical. Um, path, if you will. Um, and then you can see here in this final example, we have this full expanded myregistry.com, uh, and then, you know, you, you can see the parallelism going, like, there's not, there's not much short naming kind of going on here. And so you can see, like, with this structure, you can start seeing a, a pattern that, that would be very good uh, for us to, um, to, to leverage in container D. So, like, this column right here, there's lots of possibilities to get to this, but this is much more Restricted, and I'll, and I'll show you how this works in, in a little bit. Um, so there's other there's other approaches to image naming, and um, they're all great ideas. And um, but there's a there's a few um, a few kinds of problems with them. The first one, so like self-describing images, where you like write the name of the thing inside of it. Um, the 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 main problem with that is the uh, decentralized trust problem. And I have the word massive collisions, which I I should have just said decentralized trust. Um, and, uh, but, but basically the idea is that if two people make an image Ubuntu, who is the real Ubuntu, right? And so um, we, th th this, is, this is a massive problem in naming. The other, the other massive problem, um, the, other, the, the other approach I've seen in, in naming is um, URI schemes. Um, and it, they, I have an example here where it's like docker colon slash slash docker.io library Ubuntu. Um, and this is, it, it's a good approach because it, it it steps outside of the existing image naming syntax, but at the same time, um, it confuses like protocols and formats. Um, it's redundant, right? Like, like uh, I, can, I can store that information somewhere, uh, somewhere else. And what, what? Um, so I can just store this part, the Docker.io library thing, and then um, like if if I want to if I want to have my image as a different format, my operations team. Uh, can't change that. They, they have to go through and change all the protocol schemes. So basically, if you use a protocol scheme, it's quite operationally limiting. Like, whereas if I don't use a protocol scheme, I could say I could decide, hey, I want to use SSH instead of Git, or I want to use uh, Gopher or something like that. Uh, like, it doesn't matter. So like, we don't necessarily want the protocol on the actual reference to the image. So anyway, so this is what we're going to do in Container D. Um, and there's, there's still a few details that need to be worked out, and I'm sure there's lots of discussion, and I haven't done a full spec on this, but um, this is what I've been experimenting with uh, uh, up to this point. And so what this slide is showing is the um, lineage from kind of the Docker short name to the Docker canonical name um, to what we, uh, the concepts that we're going to be using in, in Container D. And so in Container D, uh, so in, in Docker we have the short name, which we expand to this canonical name. Um, and Everything from this point up is Docker. Everything from this point down is how Container D sees, sees things. So Container D is going to be operating um, around something called remotes, and I have a, I'll, and we'll get to that in a second. But um, what we do is we take this image name and we break it down into uh, two parts. Uh, one part is called a locator, and what the locator does is, is it's like the repository name and a um, and, and the uh, and the host name, um, but in the sense that the host name is just a namespace. It's just a matcher, right? Like you could you could prepend it with anything. Um, but what you do is you give this whole thing to a uh, resolver, and I'll get to that in a second. And you can say, hey, give me back how to fetch things. And the other component here is the object, and this is just like a like an object ID. So this could be a tag, it could be a hash, it could be it could be anything. Um, but basically, it identifies a, um, a like a content addressable object within. Uh, the locator's namespace. So, um, ooh, that's too small. Um, so, so here I, I, have, I have a little bit of Go code showing this concept, and we have a um, 
So we have, so, so what happens is it's a two-step process, is you have a resolver and then you have a fetcher. And so what you do is you say, all right, resolver, give me, um, give me this fetcher. And so you hand it this, this long locator string and you get back a fetcher and then you use this fetcher to actually perform the fetch. And so, and, and what you can do um, in, so I, I have, a, I have a, a, a prototype I'm working on and it's like 140 lines of code to do all of image pull when you use this concept. And it gets rid of a whole bunch of authentication, it gets rid of a whole bunch of complex namespacing issues. It makes things so much easier. Um, and so the, I don't know if anybody saw the hint up here, but um, on top of this system, um, we can build something that's really, really close to Git remotes. And Git remotes, I think, is a great model because you can identify like an, an entire set of information about uh, in, under a given locator or a locator prefix, and then you can say, this is how you fetch images, this is how you resolve images, and you can hide all of that behind the image pull process. So it makes it much easier. Yes. Yeah, well, yeah, so you... Exactly, so, you, so that would be, so today, like if you want to pull from Hub, and if you look at the implementation we actually have in Container D, um, you can see that we have like, it'll be like docker.io um, slash library slash Ubuntu. We take this part right here, it, so this part is used to look up the registry host, and this part right here uh, will be used to match a particular repository um, in the registry, and then you can get back to, back to uh, then, then you can start giving it hashes and object names and stuff like that to, to actually get the content. But rather than saying like, we have tags and we have hashes, we say we have like an object ID or just an object name, right? So we don't need to like, so we don't need to restrict ourselves to um, our particular distribution system. Any other questions, does that cover? Yeah, one back here. Oh. That makes sense. Um, how is authentication handled? Like how do you pass in credentials in, in this? How, how do you pass in credentials? Yeah. Uh, I, so, so the, when you do the resolution here, you can hide all of the credential creation behind this resolver, right? So like you can take it from the environment. So are you familiar with how get, uh, like, uh, get credential helpers work? So, but, but there's no way, I mean, basically from, like as you're doing the res resolution to then pass in credentials at that, like so it's completely out of band, separate concern, the yeah. cre like credentials? Yeah, so, you, so you, you would do your, you could do your authentication here or here, but it's part of the contextual, so whatever this object is, whatever this resolver is, you would do your authentication in that part right there. Are you looking for specifics? I, well, no, I'm just wondering, I mean, because it's like today, object that you pass in that has like some credential information. Um, so it's like if I, you know, because like assuming, um, you know, yeah, I'm just trying to understand like okay. how you actually get it in because like basically you're going to have to set up like a, without assuming you're persisting the credentials to the disk, right? Like, so like information comes in with the, with the credentials to do the, the pull, yeah. I can like call a separate API to set up a context that will somehow be available to the re resolve. Because like, I don't want like a global context for credentials because that one re API call might be for a specific user or whatever, right? So I'm just trying to understand that flow. Yeah, so, so that's a good question. Um, uh, I wish I had a, 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 a more complete document at this point, but I don't. This is, this, this, these slides are, um, so I have, an, I have a slide implementation and uh, these slides and we need to do a full specification for it. But the, but the idea is that the, um, when you're actually resolving your fetcher, um, you're giving it not just the namespace, you're giving it the full image name. So it can choose, so it, it, it so that this resolver could have a configuration like for, hey, this user, uh, you know, um, I build the cloud, right? Uh, ha, ha, it will test, say, hey, can, um, do I, I need to get the credentials for I build the cloud, and it would, it would go, it has the entire context for the repository to resolve those uh, credentials. Does that make sense? So it's like basically when setting, like constructing the resolver? You, you, 
Yeah, so when you construct the resolver, like the resolver might like include like a user environment oh, or an okay. authentication right. environment. Yeah, yeah, so I get that. Yeah, so th this er this arrow, sorry, so this is like endlessly configurable. This resolver could be anything. It could be like a um, it could be like environment variables. It could be okay. uh, a callback system. It could be um, whatever you need. The idea is to make it as flexible as possible and not have any like like be able to do kind of any kind of authentication system within that resolver and within that fetcher. And, and but the but the idea is that we have a two-step process so that once you resolve the fetcher from the locator, now you don't need to worry about authentication, the actual fetching and pull code. Cool. Does that cover cool. it? Yeah. Cool. A repo or oh. Um, I have a question about this: the string literal library that is used in a lot of these examples. Is that just a aspect of Docker Hub that that's like the default repo, or yeah? So, so um, yeah, that, that, so this is a little history. Um, so this Ubuntu, um, and I don't let's see. So when you uh, we don't have the example here, but so when you take Ubuntu, um, actually Ubuntu is short for library slash Ubuntu. And then when you go, and when you have a short name, which is two components, this is in Docker, you then add the registry to the front of it, and then you get this canonical name. And so what the proposal is for container D is to say, well, we don't want, we don't need, necessarily need short names. We can namespace everything. We can solve all those problems we talked about earlier. But this is the full canonical name uh, for, that, you, that you can use to resolve both a registry um, or like a namespace. So it doesn't, like in this case, this doesn't need to be the Docker I.O. registry. This is just the Docker I.O. registry space, if you will, the namespace actually. Um, and then this is just, this would be the actual storage location of the image uh, on the hub. Is that, yeah. is that clear? Good. Uh, just to connect a little bit to the question asked earlier. So the uh, registry authentication process that is there today, the Docker login or whatever, just trying to tie that into this flow of the fetcher and yeah, the yeah, resolver and fetcher. So is it kind of like an out of band thing? So whatever you are doing to uh, authenticate to whatever uh, uh, thing that is storing your images, whether it is the Docker registry or who knows, like GitHub, if they are start using it or whatever. So the flow of, you know, you authenticate separately and then you somehow tie it into your resolver. Or, so it's like external process that you'll be tying into your resolver. You'll be writing resolvers specific to the yes, the, yes. The, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It'll let you do more narrow implementations. Like, like, so even though we use the same authentication systems between, say, hub and a private registry with token auth, right? Like, there's subtle differences that where you might want to have different implementations look up the authentication differently. Like, we could we could fast track hub authentication because we know when we're talking to the hub. We know we're always talking to the same auth server, whereas with a private registry, you you need to resolve the auth authentication server and, and spend a few more requests. Okay. So yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, all right. So so let's let's go back really quick. Um, I only have one or two more slides, um, but I wanted to go back and look at pulling an image again from a step by step process, just so we can review it. Um, and th this is how we're going to view it in Container D. Um, so the first step. Uh, like is, is resolving the man in manifest or index. We covered that with naming um, and the tricks around that. Um, we then download all the resources referenced by that manifest, um, and that's done, by, that's done with the fetcher. It's an algorithm uh, implemented on top of the fetcher. Um, and then we unpack the layers into snapshots, uh, which Derek is going to be talking about here in a, in a few minutes. Um, and then we register those mappings between manifests and their constituent resources inside of the metadata store so that they can be used and understood within the system. And so back to this slide, um, you know, so we talked a little bit about the remotes um, and how the remotes can be used. Um, so, so this hopefully, like, after discussing this and, and showing you, you all this, this diagram makes a lot more sense. So what we can do is when we're fetching, we can resolve all of our data out of the remotes, put it in the content store, register that content with the metadata store and, and things like media types, disposition about the content, uh, relations between the content to make things like garbage collection very easy. Um, and then we can take that, we can now consume that content, unpack it, and then turn it into snapshots which can be turned into root file systems. Um, which in container D, which I haven't talked to about uh, this much, 
um, is done through mounts. And so, and so Derek's going to talk about how we, once we've done this pull process and, and we have snapshots, how do we take these mounts and turn it into um, a root file system for the actual container? Um, oh yeah, so I, that was a great transition, except I want to talk about this tool. Um, so the disk tool, um, so all of this, um, I've been implementing a, um, a, a toolkit um, that, that's uh, to experiment with, with like low level image primitives, uh, such as uh, polling and ingesting and, uh, and status querying. Um, and it's called the disk tool, it's in container D right now. Um, and it will, like you can, like one great thing that, that I use all the time is uh, the apply layer command and it's just a, we, we've basically taken the um, uh, application code for tar export from the, um, from the Docker daemon and then turn that into a command so I can pipe a tar to it and apply it. And so I can, um, the, if you read the development reports, there's some cool little jQuery pipelines where you can um, take a manifest, you can uh, run it through jQuery and then use some like XR magic to download things in par parallel and then actually get to a root file system all with like a, a crazy shell pipeline. So if you want to play around with it, I, I recommend uh, taking a peek at it. Right, and uh, Derek's going to talk about the graph driver. Thank you. Hello. All right. Uh, let's talk about graph drivers. Uh, so first, before actually going into kind of what we've uh, added to ContainerD around graph or snapshots, first let's talk about kind of graph drivers and how we got to this point. Um, so I would describe graph drivers as kind of being both the best and worst part of Docker. It's, uh, I would say that uh, it really did a lot to unlock the usability of Docker um, from making build simple and fast to making kind of the distribution of images really lightweight. So all, all the stuff that Stephen was talking about before in terms of uh, having a Merkle DAG and having these layers that we can just uh, kind of slice up and, and send over. Um, really the, the graph driver interface has uh, unlocked that. So AUFS was where it all started. So in kind of the first versions of Docker, there was, there was just AUFS uh, that introduced the union file system model uh, that we use for layers today. And that model has persisted. Uh, the graph driver interface was added um, in this this interface was just basically taking what AUFS was doing and it was allowing it to be implemented on top of uh, block level uh, snapshot file systems uh, like ButterFS, ZFS, uh, the device mapper implementation. Um, later Overlay came along and Overlay's kind of become uh, one of the de facto standards for doing the union file systems. Uh, and Docker 110, we introduced a content addressability layer on top of graph drivers. So previously, what we had in uh, Docker graph drivers, we had these random IDs that were associated with every layer. So when you would do a Docker build, every step of the build would create a new layer. Uh, you could assign some random ID that was associated with those, with those layers. And we would take those IDs and we'd send them up to the registry we would have an image uh, configuration that would uh, list out what these layers are. Uh, the problem with that is there is no guarantee when you're pulling something that the layers that you're pulling back and putting on disk with these IDs were actually the same layers that were built with. Uh, so in 110, we actually introduced a content addressability layer on top of the graph driver. So without making any changes to the graph driver, uh, we added something called the layer store, which essentially took the content in the layers and it addressed them by the content uh, that actually make up those layers. Um, so right now that, that content address is actually a hash of the tar that is used uh, to uh, create that layer in the first place. So on build, uh, there's a tar stream that would be created. Uh, that tar stream would be used to extract into, uh, into the layer and we use the hash of that, that stream to reference that layer. Um, the image store uh, is providing contrast ability over the entire image. So we talked about having kind of a Merkle DAG where we have uh, an image configuration that's referencing other 
content addresses, and then we actually take the then we actually take the uh, content address of that configuration, um, and that's actually stored in the image store. And we also have a reference store, which uh, essentially taking the names that Stephen was talking about and mapping those to the, the image content addresses. Uh, so what, what we have today in Docker is an architecture that, that looks a lot like this. We have the original graph driver, and this graph driver is responsible for, for managing all these layers. Um, it's also responsible for mounting these layers. So when you get a layer out of the graph driver, you're actually given a, a mounted location on, on disk. Uh, the layer store on top of that is, it's, it's, it's a pretty light layer, but it's, it's ensuring that everything that's, uh, every time a layer is referenced, that it's referenced with a content address. Um, and then we have the image store and then all the container logic talking directly to the layer store, whereas previously it would have been talking directly to the, the graph driver interface. Um, reference store on top of that, and the daemon is going to uh, talk to all of those in order to uh, implement all the commands that you're going to run within Docker. Uh, so how do we take this and kind of evolve it and take it to the next level with, with container D? Uh, we actually found that the graph driver is, for all of the, the problems that we have with it, related to mostly people filing bugs that are really hard to diagnose constantly, uh, is uh, this layers approach really, really worked. Um, and it, it, was, it was missing a few components uh, that we really needed to kind of design into into the storage layer. Uh, so this is kind of what we come up with from there. So, so Stephen uh, referenced these content store, metadata store, and the uh, snapshots in his diagram about polling. Um, so how this ends up looking is we have this, the snapshotter that's just responsible for handling layer snapshots. So when you unpack a layer on disk, it is going to unpack it into the snapshot, uh, into the snapshotter. Um, the metadata store is just responsible for uh, storing every content address, every name, um, every uh, blob that we pull from the registry. Uh, it's going to be in this metadata store. Uh, everything will be referenced by content addresses uh, to ensure that we don't have to go back later and kind of <coughs> change the way that we reference things in order to get uh, content addressability. Um, so in the end from all of this, what we really want is two things. We want this configuration and we want a rootFS. Um, now one of the big differences with the snapshot interface that, that we've designed is that it is not responsible for mounting. And this is really, really important because a lot of the headaches that we've had with the graph driver have been related to that the graph driver is responsible for this mounting. There's, whether there's race conditions between unmounting, you want to remove a layer and it's still mounted, uh, unmount failed, or um, just not being able to take advantage of being able to do the mount inside the container. Uh, so we've, we've changed the interface so that uh, the snapshot, the snapshotter is just responsible for returning the mounts that uh, we're going to use to actually create the container. Um, so if you're familiar with the graph driver interface at all today, uh, the snapshotter interface shouldn't look too different. Uh, we still have kind of the same concept of Getting the getting layers that are already there, um, putting them back in a way, but uh, we've added a much more explicit lifecycle to this. So whereas before you would do a get, make some changes, do a put, um, now we have this idea of a prepare, and what the prepare will do is it will give you a new uh, rewrite active uh, layer that you can make all your changes on top of. And when you're done, you can commit it or you can remove it. Um, so in the case of unpack, 
what you'll end up doing is you'll be uh, taking the, the parent. So if you're unpacking a new layer, you take the, the layer uh, that came before it, you'd prepare it, um, mount it, do your unpack, uh, unmount, and then you would commit it into um, using the, the content address uh, that, that you calculated during your unpack. Um, so we still have these kind of string reference keys, um, but you know this this gives us the flexibility to just use content addressability or use these content addresses when we actually go and commit uh, the layer. So instead of just having create a new layer, uh, do some changes, and then you're kept with this ID that you have to map around, we have this explicit commit that takes an active layer. Uh, makes it a read-only committed layer that you, you cannot make changes and it will forever be referenced by uh, the content address. Uh, another big difference is there's nothing in here that's, that will be giving you a tar stream and there will be nothing in here that's, that's ingesting a tar stream. Um, it's, it's really not the responsibility of, of this layer to uh, define what the format for layers are uh, in the registry. So, we have the OCI standard, which uh, in the image spec, it clearly lays out what, what a layer looks like. Right now, it's a, it's a tar. Um, there's some subtleties in those layers related to um, mostly historical reasons. If you go back to uh, the graph drivers originally only having AUFS, those, that AUFS metadata is actually part of the standard now. So for whiteouts and something called opaque directories. Uh, these actually are inside the TARs that the graph driver will ingest and give you. Uh, whereas here, we're, we're not trying to be tied to uh, how, the, how the snapshots are created or how, uh, how you would actually uh, go about uh, exporting the snapshot. Um, so, we tried to make it as simple as possible. I mean, this is, I think this is the limit of uh, what we have in the, in the snapshot package today. It's, it's pretty small uh, ideas. We'll have something that's, that's pluggable. So right now we have implementations for overlay. We have a ButterFS implementation and we have kind of a naive copy implementation. Um, so you can expect that we're probably gonna focus more on having this be a pluggable interface rather than uh, trying to re-implement Vice Mapper and ZFS and all the other creative things that uh, people create for graph drivers. Uh, we don't we don't want to be the roadblock for that. Uh, so as you can see, this is this is just an evolution of what we have in graph drivers today. We still have the same uh, sort of relationships. Um, we still have kept the interface small and kind of the the string references that we have. I have a question. Um, how do you, who's responsible for deletion, like in terms of like if there's a complex uh, tree or garbage collection or like does a snapshotter take care of, you know, basically garbage collection of unused committed layers? So the, the snapshotter will be responsible like when you actually call remove uh, to remove anything that's uh, no longer referenced, um, but uh, it's it's going to be more the responsibility of the command uh, that's accessing the the metadata store in order to propagate those deletions to all the parents and stuff. Uh, so you may want to delete one layer, but you don't necessarily want to delete all of them because you don't know the snapshotter doesn't know what is being referenced by something like the metadata store. Um, so garbage collection really has to be done one layer up that's holding the references. Um, so from a garbage collection perspective, you would, you would go through the metadata store and you would see what is, what is actually referenced. And you see there's, there's actually this walk function here. Uh, so if you wanted to do like a mark and sweep garbage collection, you could, uh, could walk through and check to see what's actually been marked in the, the metadata store. Um, but yeah, we, we, we haven't defined what the uh, garbage collection is going to look like, but 
yeah, it's, it's, it's not going to be something where, uh, like, don't expect, like, a clean function or something. Yeah, yeah. That I was just curious of whose sorry. responsibility is for knowing that, like, this, I mean, this node is actually has, like, two act, like two other nodes that are referencing it, therefore. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, so, so if I say remove, I assume it's going to give me an error, so something at a higher level for really needs. Yeah, to absolutely. Okay. So the, the snapshotter is responsible for maintaining kind of the integrity of its internal references. Um, it's and I just have one other question. This is more general and also applies to the last um, topic that Stephen talked about. Was like, you guys are showing Go interfaces here. Is like, how much, like, how closely is this going to match like the gRPC layer? Like, you know, it's basically like one to one, or this is really much more of an internal thing, and the gRPC might be a completely different, you know, level of abstraction. Yeah, I, I, I don't think we've completely figured that out yet. I, I think that's one of the things that we kind of want to figure out from talking to everybody is, is what are these integration points that, that we should focus on. Um, the whole gRPC uh, the definition is, is, is still kind of in flux. Um, from the perspective of an implementer of this, this interface, um, we, our goal is to, to leverage the new Go 1.8 plugins feature um, oh. to allow uh, you to just implement this interface and register it uh, inside of Containerd to use it uh, rather than trying to uh, define some sort of uh, RPC interface for implementing plugins. Sounds great. Let me go back. So, uh, yeah, this is the last uh, slide on snapshots. So this is, this is just... Uh, showing what, what the life cycle will look like of the snapshots with, within this model. Uh, so if we start off with kind of this, this P0, uh, we would call prepare on it, and we would get this active uh, layer. And this active layer uh, is what you would mount, what you would, where you would make your, your changes in. Uh, when you're done, commit. And you, now you have a new read-only committed uh, layer. You could prepare that to want to create a container directly from that. Um, so A prime represents changes that were made in, in that active layer. Um, if, you make, if you continue to make changes, uh, you get A double prime. You would uh, also be able to commit that to get P2. Um, and if you, if you were thinking, for example, that uh, when you committed the second time, it would be based off P1, it's it's still the same active. Where's the, the slide messed up? Uh, P2 is actually parented directly on P0 uh, when, when the commit is called. Um, the reason that is is because when you defined this active layer and you called prepare on it, uh, that is the parent of every commit. Um, so if you, were to, if you wanted to continue work, um, you wanted to save your work along the way, uh, you wouldn't be creating a chain. You would just be creating these uh, snapshots. Um, and then when you're done, just remove the layer. Uh, any more questions on uh, the snapshots this interface? So you said you don't want to handle all of the sort of esoteric types of graph drivers built mm -hmm. in. Did I, did I get that right? Uh, yeah, our, our goal isn't to at, at least pull it into to container D, all the, the graph drivers that we have today. Uh, so what is the extension mechanism going to be if I want to do a new graph driver? Uh, so if you want to use an existing graph driver? If I want to do a new one to myself. Oh, OK. Uh, so uh, we just merged kind of the, the initial plugin PR that will be used as a base for this, but this, this should be the extension point, is actually implementing this Go interface um, and building a, a plugin from it. Sorry, so the model is that I write a PR, I send a PR, I get it merged. Like, is oh, it actually a third-party plugin? Uh, right now, we'll consider them third-party plugins. We haven't decided uh, kind of how, how much we want to add to the base. I mean, I, ideally, uh, we want to add as, as little as possible to the actual container D code, but uh, the, the way the plugins would work is that uh, you would load your 
third party plugin into the, the directory, into the plugins directory. But using the new .so support or? Yeah, okay. yeah. That was the part I was missing. Yeah, yeah, so, oh, I, I, yeah, I should, I should make that clear. When we say the, the plugin stuff added to, to Go 1.8, I mean, this is dynamic loading .so. Um, uh, so there shouldn't, you, you no longer will need to com have your plugin uh, or your, your graph driver in our tree so that, you know, when containerd builds, it's included, um, but actually just being able to load it when the, when the process starts up. Yeah, no, I, I was just, yeah, I was just trying to clarify. So the drivers do not have to be in tree. They can be compiled externally and then just imported as a Go library. Yeah. Or whatever the new 1.8 model. And I think we're going to be discussing that a little more later as well. Yeah, so there's, it's, it's, this isn't going to be the only, the only extension point. All right, let's just... Everybody. Yeah, so I'll talk about networking and runtime a little bit, and it'll be pretty quick because there's not much new happening in runtimes nowadays. Like we have the OCI spec, we're working towards a 1.0, and a lot of the runtime refactorings that we did happened in the initial containerd port, which was I don't know six months ago or something like that. So. As far as networking goes, there's no networking in Containerd. We had this pretty, this is one of the first, like, after we announced our work towards Containerd 1.0, this is probably like the second or third issue that popped up on our issue tracker. And it was about adding CNI support for Containerd. And we got a lot of feedback from everyone in the community and then us internally that it's probably better off to leave networking out. And you can read the full discussion there. But the big thing is, like, containers need networks or they're pretty useless overall. And you have about three different ways to add networking to containers. And with the OCI spec in the namespaces field, especially on Linux, you have the type of the namespace and then a path and namespaces are usually represented by a file in proc, or, and you can bind mount that somewhere else, but you can provide a pre-populated network namespace for containers. So if you're doing a pod-like concept where you have a persistent network namespace across multiple containers, you can set this up independently and have multiple con containers join this existing namespace. And also, in the OCI spec, you have pre and post start hooks where you can have the container create its own network namespace and then populate it as part of the uh, create or start step. And probably the preferred way of setting up networking is during create and start. And a big part of Containerd's API today is that the creation of a container and the starting of the user's process is split up into two API calls. So today in Docker, you have uh, Docker create and then Docker start. And create in Docker creates like the read write layer for the container, sets up container information such as like host config and arguments, but it doesn't actually start the container and the docker start does an atomic like creating namespaces creating c groups and then starting the users process and when we drop down a level in container d the create of a container is the create of the c groups create of the namespaces preparing the namespaces and then the users defined process such as like run my sequel is in the start step so it makes it super simple to set up networking in container D. You just create the container. You can get the container state back. You can go in, add interfaces to that, that container's network namespace, bring them up, like set an S on it, set the IPs. And then after that's fully populated, you can verify that the network interfaces are up. Then you can start MySQL, and you don't have to worry about a race of pulling or 
hoping that the interfaces are up before the user's process comes up and tries to start binding to the IPs. So on the runtime side, there really isn't much new. We still have the shim, so we can support restoring containers if container D goes down or its higher layers go down, reattaching to IO, things like that. Uh, the runtime aspect of it is about the same as usual. I think a lot of people are familiar with OCI now, the standard actions that you can perform on a container. And Container G just basically exposes a GR, GR, gRPC API for managing those. And the runtime is kind of your extension point. And one thing we learned from multi-platform support is that we would like everyone to extend via like a run C type CLA um, for multi-platform, but it doesn't make sense for everyone. And when people were implementing different things like Solaris or Gels, things like that, they were still happening to make code changes in container D. So while you can still extend via run C type APIs, you you also have the option of compiling in a different runtime in container D. So for things like Windows will be a compiled in module. The shim is compiled in, or if you don't want to use the shim and you just want that additional a few millisecond start time or a little less overhead and you don't care about live restore, then you can compile that out and bind to the library directly. And so we have the runtime interface. This is a swappable interface in container D. Um, you have a runtime which is responsible for the creation of containers. And this create step is your basic OCI create. It creates the container, makes sure the state's set up, and gets all the namespaces and C groups set up. And it returns a container object that you call start on and get state. And this container object will be extended later with like Linux container, Windows container, Solaris container with additional things because each platform defines different uh, additional actions you can perform. So on Linux, you have pause, resume, checkpoint, exec, and Windows has exec and a couple others. So these container interfaces that the core works with can be extended that way. And the runtime is basically just its responsibility lies in creation of containers, the aggregation of containers, loading, like providing the container D core with all the containers that it knows about, removing those containers, and providing events on the containers. So as far as the runtime goes, it's basically what you know today, just having the interfaces split up a little and more defined extension points. So any questions? Hey, so my name is Mikhail. Um, it's going to be even faster than what Michael is. Integration is actually pretty easy, which is a good thing, so there's not much to say. So Michael talked quickly about the runtimes. So Go 1.8 came out, and with it, the ability to uh, have plugins proper, like if you familiar to see, and it's a DL open, and you, you load a shell library. So right now, since yesterday, we mirrored the PR. Um, the, run, the actual runtime we're using is a plugin. It's a, it's a .so library that basically container D load when it starts, which basically means if you ever want to, um, I don't know, write a Vagrant plugin for container D, uh, you, act, you write, you, inter, you implement the interface, you write it, uh, you compile it, you put it in the directory, and container D will, uh, will load it. And in the request, you just say, like, I want to use a Vagrant runtime, and you will use it, and it will be transparent for the rest of your, of your binary. Um, so not only can you extend plugins, um, I mean runtimes with plugins, you can also add new services. So we have at the moment two built-in ones, uh, probably going to be three or four at the end, which, is, which is, right now we have the content store um, and the execution, which allow you to um, basically run containers. Um, with the gRPC service plugin, you can actually um, add whatever services you want and use one single endpoint, one single uh, connection to a demand to uh, 
I know if you want to build your H3 in the container D, you will be able to do that, for instance. And finally, Snapshooter, which is your graph driver, uh, also can be added via plugin. So um, earlier, earlier this month, uh, before we had this version of container D, I tried to integrate it with Docker, and um, surprisingly, it was super easy. It actually removed a lot of the uh, crust and lock issue we have with uh, right now, with implementation we have right now in Docker. Um, because we managed to streamline even bef even before the one we have right now, which is the more streamlined version of the uh, of the runtime, um, it allows us it allows me in Docker to basically don't really care about all this looking part because there's an inherent thing that Containerd right the way it does right now works. Um, and a nice thing about it is porting over once Containerd will be uh, finalized with all the execution with all the services GRPC services ready, uh, you don't have to port them all at the same time. So since the, the, last, the current version has this concept of mounts that was earlier uh, in the slides, it's basically with, I don't, if I don't want to port uh, all the distribution uh, side of Docker from day one, I don't need to. I just need to generate this type mount, pass it to the execution, and it will actually mount using the actual graph driver that Docker has, and we're in perfectly fine. This is what, this works just fine, it's very easy. So I can, we can start by, we're probably going to do start by uh, porting the execution first because it's the smallest part to port, and then over time, move over to using the service which has the content stored and the distribution. Um, this is good because in the end, um, it allows you, as you as a consumer of Containerd, you basically don't have to worry about all this very, very low level stuff. Um, all this magic thing will be um, hidden behind Containerd and you, your code will just be um, the logic of what you're adding on top, what's the value your product add on top of it, which which is very nice because then you don't have to worry about all those bugs. And because uh, the container surface code is so small, um, it's un it also be unlikely to be buggy compared or have issue with locking. Um, so that's basically it for for the integration. Um, does anyone have a question about this part or does he have uh, worries about how they will integrate the product? So uh, runtime and snapshot list will be uh, integrated via uh, this Go 1.8 uh, run uh, plugins. And how about gRPC service? I mean, those it's, are like for clients, right? Yeah, but well, so if you write this, so uh, Containerd come with a set of built-in gRPC, or we, or we will chip them with some of them, right? right? If you ever want to, so because they register, it's a plugin, so it, when it's loaded, um, it has a function that register itself with the, uh, with the core, with the program of the daemon, and then the daemon actually just exposes this service with the, uh, with the standard of the RPC library. So you can technically implement any one you want and add it there. It's just that the client needs to know the interface. You need to have access to, the, when you compile a client, you need to know that the interface. But technically, if, because you're doing both, if you usually, either you're, you're getting this gRPC from somewhere and you, have the, and you build your client to be able to access it, I mean, there's still a part you have, you have to implement the service on both sides. Thank you. So uh, today with uh, Docker D, we can uh, register more than one runtime on a given host. And when you actually run the container, you can ch choose which runtime that you want to use for that particular container. So will that feature continue to be supported on a given host? You can have multiple runtimes, and at the time of the container launch, you can choose which runtime uh, is used for that particular container? Yeah, that's still going to be correct. Part of the create request is actually the runtime name you want to use. So basically, when you say create a container, you actually say use this runtime with it. And if the runtime is registered, then it will create it. If it's not, then you will get no such runtime error from the container D. And also you'll support uh, saying that which one is the non-default for a given host? Uh, no, you have to specify the runtime every time you create a container at the moment, but it's... Yeah. Also, so then when you use your Docker Swarm, right? So which one will it use by default? So if you want to use a different runtime, but want to use Docker Swarm, how do you specify um, which runtime you should use? Swarm, Swarm is on top of container D, not underneath. Yeah, so in, now because you don't allow specifying of the default runtime on a given host. That means that the only runtime that can be used with Swarm is the one it comes, it defaults to, right? 
Well, that's up to Swarm. I mean, that's other, it all depends how Swarm Kit is, is going to be integrated with ContainerD, right? So it could it could be an option. It could be that Swarm Kit ability to actually have this new field where you can specify which runtime you want this this service because it's a service, not a not a thing run on top. So it will it would you will have to see how we how the integration between the two works. But there's no limitation. Um, no, there's no technical limitation preventing Swarm to let you choose different runtime for different things. Um, but, uh, today, there's no option. Right? To, to, today, it's impossible. Well, today, yes, because that's the way it was designed. Um, but ContainerD wasn't designed, especially uh, targeting uh, Swarm or Docker. It's been designed to be um, um, a low level ContainerD, a low level demand that anyone can build on top. So it's not, even though Docker is going to use it eventually, it wasn't designed its purpose. We, we made it um, agnostic to any higher level um, customer or clients, basically. Just curious, what's the like technical reason for actually like registering a, a runtime as opposed to like just passing in the path to the binary? Um, well, it depends. It's um, so it's more flexible this way. You can't always assume. So you you load the run you um, you can't always assume access to the file system. Let's say for instance, I know the runtime. I just I just need um, you might actually not need an extra binary for your runtime. You might not exist. So in that case, you can just build everything you need inside the runtime. Um, so you, it, this, this, this way gives you more flexibility. You can use a, an external binary like uh, the shim we ship does, you use Rancis, or you, or you don't really need to if for some reason you don't have a binary and it, all you have is a library um, that needs to be called. Okay, so, so there'll be like a full like, list runtimes, create runtime, delete runtime type APIs? It's a possibility. Right now, there's none. Now you have to know them. But right now, we only have one runtime. But yeah, it, it might it might make sense. I mean, the, the interfaces are not set in stone yet, so we're still working on them. Uh, but probably, yeah, being able to um, query continually about the list of runtime being loaded are probably going to be thing. It might actually be, end up being an event when you start the container uh, D that it will just stream you all the events of this runtime got registered, and you can just automatically decrypt, decrypt them without having to actually request them. It's up to a debate. Any more questions? You want to do it? I'll do it. Okay, I'll just do it. So, you want to do it? Okay. So, um, from in on, what we're planning on doing is, um, Steve, I've uh, been working on a, on a POC where you actually can demonstrate from end to end, like getting an image, um, storing onto disk, um, using the snapshot that you want. And then finally, out of that, creating a bundle and sending container D and have the container running on. So that's the next thing we want to do. Um, and also the metadata store, um, which will, which will be a store actually to um, to store some interesting metadata about things we store for the snapshot store, for instance. It will be about to store the um, the relationship between different commits. If you remember what um, Derek talked about um, earlier, and we planning to have help on making. Uh, Windows support on continuity, which will have to be built in because there's no support for plugin right now on um, on uh, on Go for Windows. I think that's it. That's it. Any question regardless any part of the of the presentation you still have? Nope. And I think after it was. How feel? Oh, maybe yeah. So maybe yeah, yeah. It's 10:20. So let's take a break, and then we have two talks, uh, one by Phil and one by Tim. Uh, maybe 10 minutes break. We'll, we'll gather at 10:35. Uh, uh,